Thank you. I am Ron Hamilton with PTP. It's my partner in crime, Jim Herndon. We've been doing web hacking. Well, I've been doing web hacking about 20 years, Jim for about 10 years. And we've done, I, I don't even know how many assessments here in the state of California, other state agencies, private sector. So what we usually like to do with these presentations is bring you some real world uh, examples of web application vulnerabilities that we've seen in state government. Uh, I think all of the examples that you're going to see here today were all California state government. Maybe one's in a couple other states. Yeah, there might be some others thrown in there. But everything that we're going to talk about today, we have seen here in the state of California. Now, if you've seen uh, one of our presentations before, um, we have five examples today. One of them you've probably seen before if you've seen us talk about this before. The other four will be new ones. And we know we usually have a mix of audience, technical and non-technical, so we've given you a couple that are fairly basic, um, fairly non-technical, a couple that are a little more technical, and one that's kind of in between. So that's what we have for you. I think we have 45 minutes, is that right? Right, so we'll probably blow through these first few slides pretty quickly, and feel free to interrupt, ask questions, raise your hand, blurt out questions, we don't care, we don't mind being interrupted, we like to keep it pretty casual. So, of course, why are we here? Well, uh, so who invented the World Wide Web? Anyone? Bueller? That's my favorite answer. I love that answer. Didn't he claim the internet, not the World Wide Web? So, when Tim Berners-Lee invented the World Wide Web, um, he really didn't intend for us to be doing any of the things that we're doing with it today. He never intended us to be doing Amazon, e-commerce, uh, online banking. He didn't foresee any of this. It was essentially a collaboration tool. Tim's uh, vision for the World Wide Web was basically what Wikipedia is today. That, that's, that was his dream. That's, that's where he was. Um, so we're doing all of these things mechanically with a system that was never designed to do it, which means we generally have to customize all of the controls that we wrap around these web applications. And some people do them well. Some developers don't do them well. And OWASP is probably the best resource out there. There are many resources. OWASP is probably, debatably, one of the best resources out there on where to get information about, you know, how, how do I wrap controls around my web application? How do I develop secure code? Uh, what do I need to be doing throughout the secure development life cycle to design and build a secure web application? Um, and, and this is where we've ended up. We've, we've ended up from Tim's text-based sort of gopher style uh, web application to these rich text, AJAX, highly dynamic, highly complex web applications that authenticate you, keep track of where you are, rights management, who should be doing what, and it's all never intended for this platform. And that's how we got here. Um, so we're going to jump right into it with our limited time. And our first example is the one that uh, we usually talk about when we do this presentation because it's a great example for talking about logic problems, the links that an attacker will go to to try and gather information about your website, try and reverse engineer the methods, the, the mechanics of your website, how you design the application, how it works, um, and also understand um, you know, if you've got a persistent threat or ABTs, the sort of links that they're going to go to to create custom tools and scripts and uh, ways to gather the information that they need to further an attack. So we call this credential harvesting. In and of itself, it's not a particularly uh, nasty vulnerability. We probably wouldn't even call it high risk or medium risk. We probably rate it low risk in most of the places we see it. It might even be informational. Uh, and essentially what we're talking about is the ability to systematically collect all of the valid user IDs for your web application. It might be an email address, it might be a first initial last name, whatever the makeup it is, this is all information we want. We want to know the criteria that you use for your user ID. We want to know what makes it up. We want to know about how many IDs you have. And ultimately, we would like to just have them all. We would like to have every valid user ID for the system because it's going to assist us later in our attacks. So if you're a state government agency and you publish the email address of every employee 
and the login ID is the uh, employee's email address, this is probably an informational finding. It's probably not a big deal, but that's up to you, right? We're going to report it. We're going to talk to you about your business model, the nature of the data behind this application, and figure out, is this low, medium, or high? If you're Ashley Madison, this is probably going to be high risk. So it all depends on who you are and, and, and what the nature of the system is, right? The easiest way to gather all of the valid user IDs for your system is if you give up a discrete error message. So this one's going to start out very basic, and it's going to start to get a little more complicated as we get into it. So basic attack, if you're going to tell me that that user ID is not valid, OK, thank you very much. I'm just going to write an automated script. We're going to throw that against the application with millions of known or suspected user IDs. And Jim is just going to build a text file of all the valid user IDs, which he's going to use later in, in other types of attacks. The thing about this is you have to be consistent everywhere you're accepting information from your end users. Um, so this is one that we saw that was a little more subtle. You'll notice the error message up here on the top. User ID password you entered is not found. Please try again. So that's a good generic message, right? You're not giving away whether or not the ID was valid or not. This is us attempting to log in with an account that we know is valid. The previous slide is us attempting to log in with a user ID that we know is not valid. So same friendly error message, right? Did anybody spot the discrepancy? So if you look in the URI, as developers often want to do, because they want to help themselves when they're troubleshooting, right? There's just a little error code up there in the URI. So that's enough information for us to farm valid user IDs. We see this in HTML source maybe a hidden form element, because you want to know, what was the error condition? Why did the user fail to log in? You probably want to log that, right? Well, don't give us those clues. Keep that internally. So how do you defend against this? Well, a consistent error message, as we mentioned. And secondly, what are we after? We're after some sort of brute force attack, ultimately, probably. Um, other things, but probably some sort of brute force attack. And the way you defend against brute force attacks most commonly, most easily, is an intruder lockout system. The problem is, as soon as you implement an intruder lockout system, you may or may not be presenting us with an additional opportunity to farm valid user IDs. So if you're going to give up a friendly error message saying that after the third or fifth or whatever your intruder lockout is set to, that my account is now locked out, please call the help desk or whatever, that discrete error message is now allowing us to write an automated script again and farm valid user IDs, right? So what do you do? Well, we recommend a consistent error message even if the account is locked out. Now that's where people usually stop me. Well, wait a minute. The help desk is not going to go for that. When somebody calls into the help desk, the help desk has got their script. They want to know why that user is calling as soon as possible. They want to know the cause of the problem as soon as possible. They don't want to spend 15 or 20 minutes on the phone trying to figure out what's going on. If the account's locked out, they want to know that's why they're calling, because that's very easy. I can quickly go to my account lockout script. I can deal with this customer. If I have to spend 15 or 20 minutes to figure that out, that's a big problem for us on the help desk. OK, fine. So we've run into this in many state agencies. And with the customers that we work with, what they chose to do is you take that invalid user ID and you store it for some period of time. It might be 24 hours, might be 48 hours and you track it and you deliver the intruder lockout message for invalid user IDs. Simple concept, but it takes a little bit of work and makes our life very difficult. Any questions so far? So here's something that we've seen here in the state of California. And I, actually, I don't know that we've ever seen this outside of California, Jim. We saw this here with two very large uh, California state applications from very large agencies, and we saw it twice, two different agencies, probably in a, in a span of a year and a half or two years, and it was very peculiar. And essentially what happened was they were using an intruder lockout system, and they kept the message consistent. Um, that advice was followed, that best practice was followed. So when you attempted to log into the system with a user ID that was not valid six times, the message did not change. It was the same message. We're sorry, there was a problem with your login. Please call the help desk if you continue to have problems. What was really peculiar was 
actually, no, they were giving an intruder lockout message. Sorry, I got this one confused with another one. So they were telling us we were locked out, and that was fine. The message was the same whether the account was valid or invalid. However, the discrepancy lied in an account that is a valid user ID that has been locked out, that receives an invalid password, we're trying to brute force into it, would give us intruder lockout message A. However, when we presented that as locked out account with a valid password, we were then taken to friendly error message B because they have a separate logic tree in the application. If the user ID was valid and the password was valid, but the account was locked out, it was extremely peculiar. Does anybody recognize who that is? Hopefully we've obfuscated that enough. No, nobody? Nobody from that agency knows their old screen? Okay, good. <laughs> so the guilty are protected. So this was the actual error message right here for an account that's locked out with an invalid password. And then this was the error message we got when we tried the valid password for that account that was currently locked out. Very strange. So be careful of that. We've seen it a couple times. So everything has to be consistent. Your source HTML code, the URI needs to be consistent. Um, the friendly error message needs to be consistent. Consistency is the key to preventing user ID harvesting on the login screen. Uh, not being satisfied with not being able to harvest valid IDs for um, a particular client that Jim ran into maybe, when did PERS start, Jim, two, three years ago? Um, yeah, yeah, probably. Yeah, so about two or three years ago, Jim ran into a customer. Uh, he was not able to farm valid, he wanted all the IDs because it would have been useful for another attack that we discovered as his client. So he wanted all the valid user IDs. He couldn't get it on the login page. He couldn't get it from intruder lockout. He couldn't get it from the self-registration process because it was a good process and they were using CAPTCHAs and if you have questions about that, we can handle that at the end. Uh, he couldn't get it from the self-service password reset page. All of this was handled well and handled consistently. He could not farm valid user IDs, so he was getting frustrated. Uh, and being the hacker that Jim is, while he was attempting to do all this, he noticed that the site would respond in a different time period for a valid user ID versus an invalid user ID. In fact, it was a discrepancy of almost three seconds. So when you attempted to log into the site with an invalid password, yet a valid user ID, the site was doing some work and taking extra time. Whereas if you attempted to log in with a, an invalid user ID that the system didn't know, the response from the server was very quick, as you can see there. Uh, so when Jim noticed that, what does he do? He goes, he writes a tool, he called it PER, and it will take uh, a flat text file of potential user IDs that will throw them at the system, measure the response time from the system, and then build a text file of valid user IDs for that system. If anybody wants the tool, drop us an email. We're happy to share it. It'll be on the website eventually. Questions, comments? So there are lots of places you can do this. Uh, you can farm valid user IDs, as I briefly mentioned before, from the login page, uh, a self-registration process, a self-service password reset. All of these places you have to be diligent and be careful of how much information, useful information, you are providing to potential attackers. Yes, sir. They built in a false delay for unrecognized user IDs, and it worked well. The tool no longer worked. And the tool's tunable. You can set the thresholds for the timing discrepancy. Um, if there's a session credential that has to re be refreshed, Jim just updated it to handle that. So if you can defeat this tool, you're in pretty good shape. And, and again, uh, all of this, everything we're going to talk about, all five examples, should be in the context of uh, I don't know what you want to call it, but we generally refer to it as threat vector, right? You, you don't want to be vulnerable to every script kitty in the world that can download some sort of automated tool, put in your, your URI and hit the go button. You, know, that, that's a, you don't want to be dealing with those people. You want to be managing down to persistent threats and advanced persistent threats. 
Yes, sir. Right, so uh, the question is how do you deal with uh, maybe uh, it's a distributed app and site A would allow you five times and site B would allow you five times uh, you know, to try and circumvent the intruder lockout threshold. So the key with intruder lockout thresholds and the key with brute force attacks is to understand how Jim's gonna work. Um, what's gonna happen is once he's able to farm 10,000 valid user IDs, he's gonna determine what the intruder lockout is, probably five, right? Three or five, something, something in that neighborhood. Let's just, for the sake of the discussion, say it's five. He is then gonna take the probably four most common passwords related to you, Th these will be custom tailored to you, so whether you're a bank, a state agency, whatever, uh, who are the users of the system? I mean, he has dictionary files for fans of Dilbert, Star Trek fans, uh, Rihanna fans, et cetera. He's gonna take four, or five, four passwords that he thinks are fairly relevant um, and he's gonna try them against those 10,000 accounts. Now the time it takes him to try four passwords against 10,000 accounts might be greater than your intruder lockout retention time and this is something you have to consider. Um, so we have a much longer presentation where we talk about all of these issues um, and so what I would say to you in answer to your question is consistency is key and understand the attack. So if you could set your retention to 24 hours you've thwarted that. You know, it, it, maybe it'll take him 15, 20 minutes to go through 10,000 accounts. Then what he's gonna wanna do, he's gonna want your intruder lockout to have a retention period of about 15 minutes. In other words, the amount of time the intruder lockout feature remembers bad passwords were done for that account. Not the amount of time that the account is locked, that's lockout time, but retention time. Um, we're gonna figure out what those are and we're gonna tune the attack based on what those are. So set them appropriately. If you're giving us 10 tries in 24 hours, that, that's no good to me. I mean, maybe I'll get two or three accounts if I'm lucky, right? Sir? Yeah, so there's absolutely that opportunity. You know, when we do testing, maybe we're whitelisted, maybe we're not, maybe we're uh, addressing that issue, maybe we're not. Hopefully you've got some kind of SIM, IDS, IPS, SIEM in place to detect that attack and to start blocking source IPs dynamically. Certainly I could be distributing my attack and spoofing source IPs and you've got all of those issues, but yeah. Hopefully you've got some sort of um, uh, automated IPS that when it sees that, uh, that brute force attack will do something dynamically, yeah. Or at the very least throw an alert, let somebody do something manually. Other questions? Alrighty. So the vectors we talked about, consistency is the key, and I will hand it over for Jim for the next two examples. Thank you. That's working. Okay, um, I'm gonna talk about trusting the client and um, this is the, one of the major failures that will cause the most compromise is for the developers or application to trust what is coming from the client. Um, this is where we get SQL injection, cross-site scripting, uh, one thing we call insecure direct object reference. All of these major problems come from trusting the client and the client is the browser and the user of the browser and what they can do. Um, <clears throat> so you always have to remember that hackers will control the client. And so I want to talk to you a little bit about um, a, a technology called Silverlight. Um, some of you may know about it. You, some of you may just see the uh, prompts on your computer to, to install Silverlight or update it or something. Well, Silverlight is kind of like Microsoft's answer to Flash, and it's kind of already obsolete because of HTML5, but there's a lot of stuff that's been built in there. Um, it's the greatest example of the, the worst way to build an application. <laughs> so I want to talk a little bit about it. Um, it's 
runs almost a full application on the client side. So when you load the application, it brings all the DLLs and everything to the client and saves them on the computer. Now, uh, these are the same sort of DLLs that the back end is built with. And so an attacker can actually uh, call the application and then um, download and analyze the uh, DLLs, reverse compile them, uh, reverse engineer them, and then build uh, the source code and debug files, and you can actually attach to the application in Visual Studio and debug it as it's running. And when you're doing that, you can also stop it at breakpoints, you can change values, you can um, you know, change IDs, uh, permissions, everything like that. And so what we've done is we've seen a lot of client uh, applications that are transactional that require security. And when you put the security in the front end and the attacker controls the security, you're going to get a compromise. Um, so uh, one of the things I find with a, an application like one built in Silverlight is when you return information, role information from the server that's going to be used on the client to either allow access or prohibit access from application functionality that's on the client side. And then we'll talk about encryption. Um, so this, uh, this is what you see when uh, the, the information is coming to and from the, uh, the browser and the server. This is a call to the server from the application, and it's asking for roles. If you can see it, it says get user roles. That's the name of the function that it's calling. Um, and there's a, a domain account name that's passed. This is the response. It shows the various roles that this user is uh, in. And then this is information is used to control security, role-based security on the client side. So if you can think of it already, um, we're going to start using a proxy. And a proxy is a way to stop this communication between the browser and the, and the server and modify it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, instead of asking for my user roles, I'm going to ask for administrative user roles. Um, in this case, it was called Den Mother. Does anybody recognize that? <laughs> uh, it, it was the functionality that was more administrative in the application. Um, so I, I pass the domain account DENM, which is for Den Mothers. I get the uh, group that's in there, Den Mother Group. And then all of a sudden, I have uh, administrative control over the application. Um, this is the, the, the tab that was hidden from the user that didn't have the Den Mothers group. Now they can operate those controls. Very easily changing data coming from the, the server to the application. This was a little bit more complicated, although some tools now make it easy. Microsoft has a binary communication that is kind of a compressed version of the XML. Um, and it's a little bit more difficult to modify, but you can see that there's a username outlined there in red. Um, this call is going to uh, also get role information. Um, and so in order to, uh, to modify that, I uh, brought up a text editor. You can take the copy the text out of the browser, modify it, and put it back in the proxy and send it on. There are some, uh, some proxies now that do this for you automatically. Um, but the, uh, the format of the binary communication is published by Microsoft, so you can, you can you know, find out how it's actually doing its job and then make the modification. So it was a little bit more difficult, but we were still able to get role information changed. That one is uh, P. You see user, there's sysadmin. So we just put in sysadmin and we get ad administrative rights. The proxy we usually use is BERT proxy or WebScare from OWASP. They're probably the two most common. Yeah, th and I think they've, they've got Zap from OWASP now. There's Fiddler and uh, a few others out there. Do you have a question? Yeah, 
Yes, the, um, applications like this should work like a web application where there's, when the login process is completed, there's a token that's sent to the client and that token must be returned every time. Um, when they started moving into this sort of a, a SOAP calls and all that, the XML and that, I think a lot of people kind of forgot about that and it wasn't exactly built into things. And so, um, yeah, you've got to keep track of each client and verify that that client is making the call and um, that they have, when you go to the back end, that they have permission to access the data that's being asked for. So the uh, role work never should have been trusted to the client. It should have been looked up based on your session credential, i.e. ASP session ID, J session ID, whatever that may be, um, and should never have been specified by the client, right? Mm-hmm. Well, it, like, like just HTTPS? What? Yeah, generally what the proxy does, it's about encryption between the client and the server. Usually you're using HTTPS and the proxy, that's the one that you connect to and you, you use that a certificate and then the proxy connects to the server and so it's all clear text in your proxy you're just breaking that SSL session think of it as a man-in-the-middle attack the proxy is the man in the middle it allows us to see everything clear text well anyone who's attempting to you know subterfuge anyone who's attacking you is they're gonna have that proxy right so SSL, really the only thing SSL buys you is a defense against someone along the wire being able to monitor, sniff the traffic. It does not buy you any sort of authorization or authentication. It can if you use client search, which no one does, which is incredibly cumbersome. But 99% of the time, the only thing SSL or TLS buys you is defense against uh, wire snooping. Okay, another uh, thing that we have seen is the, um, the aspect of encrypting data between the uh, server and the client, and um, also uh, this was actually a server issue that we found. So we, we compromised the server and we went to the web config file. And the web configs is usually where you put uh, connection strings to your database and you might have a username and password in the file. And here you can see that the password was encrypted. And so even though we were on the, um, on the server itself, we found encrypted passwords. But applications have to have access to those passwords, so they have to decrypt them. And it's kind of like encryption at rest. I, you know, people think that's really, the, the end all thing, but there's all, always an application that will decrypt for you, and that's where we attack. We attack the ac applications that do the decryption. And in this case, the application was using a homegrown encryption algorithm, um, and it was within the application, so we could see the code for it, and then we easily decrypted the passwords. I think Microsoft has better stuff now in the web config, encrypted sections that it also handles in a better way. Okay, I think I'll pass it back to Ron. Okay, sure. And the mitigator for the last one is generally um, what are known as hardware security modules or HSMs. So you want the encryption work done in a separate environment. You don't want keys or algorithms stored on the device that's handling the interaction with the client, right? Any questions on any of that? Alrighty. So this one is pretty basic. Uh, it's up here because we just keep seeing it over and over and over again. So we're gonna put it up here. And it's a challenge. Oh, actually, I think I jumped in the next one. So this is challenge bypass. Um, this is another one that Jim found. And it was, it was another peculiar one. It was kind of, we scratched our heads and go, why would you? <laughs> uh, and basically what we saw was it was a self-service password reset. Um, and then they also had another feature to get at your password hint, um, if you wanted to try that. And the way you got to your password hint, which, you know, 
you have no control over how terrible that or good that password hint is that your users are picking, right? They choose their own password in. It could practically be the password for all you know, unless you're going to do a character match and try and prevent that. But you know, it could be a pretty good hint um, is the problem here. And what was happening was, and this is an issue for self-service password resets also, um, where you're actually going to go change the password or be sent an email to get the password. They were asking the security questions in sequence. Um, and just last week, we looked at a major very, very large, very, very well-known uh, state agency, California app that was doing this uh, even today, asking the security challenge reset questions in sequence. Anytime you do that, you ask something like that in sequence with a self-registration or self-service password reset, or anytime you're going to ask me secrets to get me access to something, you got to do that all at once. When you do it in sequence, you give us the opportunity to try and break down each of those one at a time. And sometimes it's even worse. In this particular case, you would be asked question one, question two, question three, and then as soon as you hit the post button for question three, assuming it was answered correctly, that was the theory, you were taken to a screen that was your password hint. And it was just there for you in clear text. Okay, great. Unfortunately, what Jim found out was <clears throat> based on that, was it based on the URI or a form post? It was in the URI that you could do this. Yeah, so based on the URI, Jim discovered that he could go just put in some other account that he wanted the hint for, jump all the way to that fourth screen URI, and the hint would be right there. The, the, the developer wasn't doing all the work to get through to that final page. And I'm, I'm telling you, state of California, if I told you who it was, you'd be like, oh my god. <laughs> so these things are happening today. It seems really basic. It seems like common sense. It seems really simple, but it's going on today. So that's what it looked like. And there was the hint page. So we started out with this URI, question one, then it was question two, question three, and ultimately you arrived at display password hint. And Jim discovered that he could just go directly to the password hint page with a user ID and it would display the hint. Your password hint is spreadsheet. What's my password? Excel. <laughs> so, questions on that? All right, another very basic example, and it's up here for the same reason, because we keep seeing it again over and over and over again, and it's weak security questions for self-service password uh, resets. Favorite color, favorite car. What country would you like to visit? Mm, okay, maybe there's a couple hundred possibilities, but that's pretty bad. Favorite color, you know, we just pulled this recently. Color of your first car, I mean, come on, that's five or six, seven, eight things, right? And if you're asking them in sequence, oh, come on. Um, and the key with asking them all in the same form post. So ideally, you're asking three questions. They're good questions. Maybe you even allow the end user to choose their own questions. Uh, we can debate on that for a long time because once the flip side of the coin is they're going to pick terrible questions, the other side of the coin is um, you know, you're not encouraging them to do something terrible like color. So I don't know. You've got to decide for your apps. We usually go with a recommendation of here's 50 questions that are pretty decent. Go with these or let them choose the questions. It's a discussion with each client. Depends on the nature of the app. Depends on the business feedback, business tolerance for that sort of inconvenience, as it were. Right. So mother's maiden name is terrible because we're going to launch a brute force script that's just going to try the top 20 most common names in the country that we're talking about. Um, states are horrible. There's only 50, right? I mean, that, that's almost as bad as it gets, but we've seen worse. And color, honestly, is worse. Color is, you know, blue, brown, black. Color is about as bad as it gets. Uh, sports are horrible, right? Uh, football, baseball, what, that's all I need to try. What year was your mother born? So going back to asking all of these questions on the same page, same form post, and then if they're not correct, please do not tell me which one was correct and which one were not correct. Think back to the first example we gave. When I answer the challenge questions incorrectly, that page should say, I'm sorry, your answers does not match our records. If this problem persists, please contact the help desk. And the help desk is going to have to take the hit, right? Do not tell me which one of those questions was correct and which one was not correct. 
And that's our five examples for this year. Any other questions, comments? Yes, sir. Can you go back, please, to the issue of uh, the whole lockup retention versus uh, lockup? Mm -hmm. Intruder lockout? Okay. Yeah, you have an account lockout. Yes. So here are the important things to consider with intruder lockout. The amount of time the account is locked out. We've seen it be 15 minutes. We've seen it be one hour. These allow us to conduct brute force attacks. We'll take four common passwords. If we farmed all the valid user IDs, we're going to cycle through those common passwords with all the valid user IDs every 15 minutes, if that's what it's set to, every hour, if it's set to an hour. If we reverse engineer the intruder lockout and we determine that it's 72 hour or permanent, permanent's what we recommend, 72 hours at least. If we determine that it's a 72 hour lockout, you know, that's going to be a big problem for us. We might not even bother with the, uh, with the attack. Uh, the other uh, settings for intruder lockout or how long does it track, track the invalid passwords for that account? In other words, if I try four bad passwords um, right now and then come back tomorrow and try four more, do I tick the intruder lockout? Is the retention period 24 hours? Is it an hour? Is it 15 minutes? Um, the, we most commonly see it's about 15 minutes to an hour, right? And that's no good. You want the retention period to be at least 24 hours, the amount of time that it's letting you try five times should be 24 hours or greater. Um, and then, of course, the last setting is how many tries do I get, right? Five, 10, three. Anything less than 10 is probably fine. <clears throat> Another key component to intruder lockout is when the account is locked out, let's say it's permanent and the user calls the help desk, uh, we highly recommend that you force a new password at that point. Um, because if we've gotten any closer, you know, we've ruled out half the potentials, you know, we recommend you not just clear the intruder lockout field. And that weird example would, could be a potential example of why that's the case. You know, maybe we locked it out and we now know the password. So when the user calls up, you want them setting a new password. And you don't want intruder lockout clearing by itself in a short period of time. Does that answer your question? Thank you. I had another question in the front. As far as let's say that you log in, it says the bad username, username is valid, it's a divided password. What we previously used to do was just have a hash filter, hash filter there to the page. The customer used to just call the customer service, give the hash filter, they will know what this is, and the hash filter is changing. So at any given time, there's no way for you to figure out what the hash filter error was. Maybe. We would have to test that. Yeah, you, we would need to go through. So we would want to see how the application responds to all the various test conditions, right? Known account, bad password. Unknown account, bad password, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Locked out account, no. So we would go through all the use cases, look for a discrepancy. If we find a discrepancy, we're farming. That's the key, right? Anything you want to add to that, Jim? No. Question? Yeah. Um, so for the homegrown encryption you have, uh, in general, can you also suggest to not do that and just use uh, Absolutely. I 100% endorse NIST approved encryption algorithms and NIST approved key links and a hardware security module. All the encryption work and the key management should be handled by an HSM. That's our, usually our recommendation. And you have to be NIST compliant. If you need to be NIST compliant or PCI compliant or ISO or any other major standard that's out there, you're going to have to have an HSM or something like that that provides separate key management. Sir. Yes. Well, it buys you some protection. So you said certificates between the client and the server. So those are, well, well let's talk about all of those things because you, know, you, you can do these things, right? 
Um, so what's very common with web services is when you have two servers talking to each other via XML, we're generally going to recommend that SOAP and there's a certificate SSL or TLS certificate on one box and on the other. This means they are authenticating to each other and encrypting the traffic. That's all good. When you're talking about a customer who's coming to a state agency website and logging in with a user ID and a password, generally they have no client cert. You have a server cert. The server cert proves that you are, in fact, CalPERS. They're not proving anything other than their user ID and their password, right? So that encrypted tunnel, the only purpose that it serves is to prevent someone who works at CalPERS, your next door neighbor, someone who works at Comcast, someone who works for the tier one ISP that that session is going through. ISP employees, local IT employees, they can sniff the wire and read your session credential. If they can get your session credential, they can become you on that web application. HTTPS pr protects against this. That encryption prevents me from sniffing the wire and lifting out your session credential. That's really all it does. The way the proxy works is our browser negotiates a TLS session to the proxy with a fake certificate. The proxy negotiates a TLS session to whatever agency with the real certificate and then the proxy displays everything in both directions, the requests and the responses from the server on the screen in clear text where we pause it, manipulate it as we see fit, and send it back onto the server. The response that comes back, we pause that, look at it, analyze it, manipulate it if we choose to, and then that feeds back into our browser. So you have two separate TLS sessions negotiated when you're using the BERT proxy. Right. Yeah, presumably I have a user ID and a password. Right. Does that answer the question? Okay, thank you. So really the whole, the whole point of your, your proxy is there just as you being an attacker. It has nothing to do with a legitimate client or anything of those sorts, is what you're saying? Yes. Yeah, a legitimate customer is probably not ever going to need to use. Now, you'll be, if you're sitting at your, if you're a state employee and you're sitting at your desk and logging into Wells Fargo, you're actually going through a proxy more than likely. You're going through what we call a reverse proxy. So your web browser is probably talking to a, um, um, a web, uh, whatever, maybe it's McAfee, whatever product you've got. You're talking to some proxy on site at your agency and that proxy passes it on to Wells Fargo. That communications will take place in one of two methods. A, it will not break the SSL, and you, your browser will actually negotiate um, an HTTPS session with Wells Fargo, between your browser and Wells Fargo directly. No one can listen to that. No one can see anything on the URIs. No one can see anything in the posts. The only thing that will be logged by the reverse proxy at your office is the fully qualified domain name. Everything after that, encrypted. No one at your office can see that. The second mode that they may be operating in, and there are a number of agencies now here in California doing this, and it's very common in the private sector, is what's called SSL inspection, whereby they're doing the same thing we do with BERT. Uh, your agency is breaking the SSL session at their outbound proxy, inspecting it for known attacks, and then negotiating another SSL session with Wells Fargo. And now if they've done it properly, you don't even get any warning and you don't even know that's happening because the SSL session negotiated between your browser and your office's proxy is with a certificate that is probably self-signed. It's a bogus certificate that belongs to your agency, but they have pushed out via uh, an IT management system, they have pushed out to all the browsers at your agency that that certificate is legitimate, which means you never see any kind of warning, if, if that helps. Yes. So hopefully that, that helps clear that up. Speaking of uh, the whole uh, SSL inspection, uh, would we as just, I mean in general, people, the average user, ever, ever have to worry about, say, uh, Symantec now or, or Bluetooth? Um, I, I think that uh, they are now able to sign certificates for your browser. Well, what ha your agency has to push out that that is a valid signatory authority to your browsers. 
All righty. Maybe time for one more question. Sir. So the TLS one that we got to UI URI is also encrypted. So what are we talking about is for TLL TLS one one point zero to one point two, right? Well, the general theories that we talked about would apply to any HTTPS encryption algorithm. Then there would be a separate discussion on SSL 1.0 is broken and we can break it and sniff the traffic, you know, SSL. So, um, and if you go to, uh, I wish I had a whiteboard. If you go to the Qualys website, Q-W-A-L-Y-S, I wonder if I have a web browser, you can check your SSL certs um, your HTTPS certs at your agency. So I'll leave you with that because I'm out of time. Um, just Google this. Um, check my SSL qualies, which I can't spell. So here it is. It's called SSL server test. SSLlabs.com slash SSL test. If you, could, if you can't see anything. <laughs> Sorry, I don't control these machines. So SSLlabs.com. That'll probably get you there, but if it doesn't, slash SSL test, and it will look at all of your HTTPS uh, certificates and tell you if they're using things like SSL 1.0 that have known vulnerabilities. You want to be TLS 1.2, you want perfect forward secrecy, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm out of time. Thank you very much for coming.